good afternoon or morning afternoon kind of right in the middle uh, everyone i want to welcome you to this very important webinar my name is cindy brown and i'm the secretary of the board for a wider bridge and i'm also a mission alumni which is a life-changing experience was a life-changing experience for me uh, the topic for today is we're going to look at the current situation in Israel and how it impacts the LGBT community, specifically focusing on Jerusalem. And I'm coming to you from Miami, Florida. So here in Florida, we have an extremely conservative governor who has made his position uh, on opposing the LGBTQIA community at every step. And here in Florida, we are also experiencing a rash of anti-Semitic behavior, even in places like Miami Beach, which currently has a, a high percentage of Jewish residents. People are finding uh, anti-Semitic hate in flyers in their mailbox or graffiti or big signs put up in the street. So it's it's definitely an issue that is concerning to a lot of folks all around the world, but we're gonna talk today about Jer Jerusalem. So just a little bit of housekeeping. This is a webinar format. So only the panelists audio and video will be on. And if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please use the Q&A box. We will have time for the questions and answers at the end of the hour. So please use the Q&A box. Don't use the chat uh, because we'd like to keep them focused into the Q&A. So now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Shira Proust. She is the newest staff member for a wider bridge. And we are so excited that she's our new development director. Shira has a personal, uh, she's personal to the issues we're gonna discuss. She lived in Jerusalem for seven years and worked for Jerusalem Open House from uh, 2006 to 2010. So we're, we are so excited to have you as part of our uh, a wider bridge family, Shira, and um, I'm excited to announce you as our moderator for today. So I am going to hand you the baton, and Shira, you can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, I am. You've heard a little bit about me and you're welcome to check out my bio. I think it was just shared on a wider bridge of Facebook, but I think the most important thing to know about me today is that I have a really, really big place in my heart for the Jerusalem Open House. I feel that um, it's a place where I personally was able to grow so much and gain so much. And I, I have, I hope that I can only spend, um, all of my years giving back to the Jerusalem Open House because I understand how important it is from firsthand. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm really excited to be able to talk about uh, what's going on in Jerusalem today with both of you, because like many of us in America, I'm based in New Jersey now, I lived in Israel for 15 years, um, but now I'm based in New Jersey. And like many of us in the States and North America, we are watching our friends, our Israeli friends, and we are watching the protests and we are watching how people are reacting to the latest government changes and legislative changes. And we want to hear from you um, about how this is hitting the community, the, the different factions of the community, the diverse factions of the community, um, and how, how it's affecting you. So today I am joined by Alon Shahar and Emuna Klein Barnoy. And uh, we're gonna have, uh, yeah, El, if you would please put their bios in the chat and you could read up on them. Um, and we'll just jump right into the program. 
So um, I'm going to start my first question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to open for a loan, but please jump in. Whoever has the right answer, you guys know uh, who has the right answers. So alone in the state, you know, as I was just saying, we're seeing a lot of protests and even conflict between the police and, pro and, and protesters. Um, can you give us some background on why people took to the streets and what is the energy like right now in Jerusalem? Sure. Thank you, Sheila, and good morning, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Wider Bridge, for hosting us. Um, so a little, a little bit of background. So Israel has now a new government for the last couple of months, and it, it is definitely um, the most religious, far-right, anti-LGBT plus um, government in the history of Israel. Besides that, our government now is pushing through the Knesset plan, plans to change the balance of power between the three branches of government, and they do it quite um, strongly and significantly and aggressively, yeah. And this legislation um, basically gives the Prime Minister of Israel and the government a power to override the Supreme Court decisions. Um, and it also limits the court's ability to strike down legislation um, that basically infringes human rights and civil rights um, while giving the government complete control over ju judicial appointments. So, um, so you can only you can only imagine how um, frightening it is, um, and the plan is criticized by almost the entire legal establishment and attorney general and Supreme Court chief and many former justices, um, and everybody calls it a threat to Israeli democracy. Um, at the same time, there's a, a, a controversy, okay? Um, not all the citizens of Israel think the same. Um, and and we at at the Jerusalem Open House we we acknowledge this fact even though most of the Israeli LGBTQ plus organizations are um, a, um, publicly a, a opposing this plan. Okay. Some people call it uh, ju judiciary reform, some call it judiciary revolution to emphasize the significance. So this is a little bit of a context. So many of our folks around the country um, are basically afraid and feel uh, that it is uh, dangerous for the LGBTQ plus community um, to experience this, uh, like the consequences of this plan. And we in Jerusalem, we, um, we acknowledge the controversy. Um, and we think that the most important aspect now is um, to provide our community with the sense of stability and the and resilience that we work so hard uh, around the year uh, 365 days a year to create um, for the community that struggles all year around and along to um, to sustain and 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 prosper um, and we we see this a uh, period of time um, a, as part of a of we usually we usually call it a marathon right so it's like this a never-ending struggle to live and exist in Jerusalem, live as ourselves, and we um, we um, conceptualize 
this period of time as as a time where we need to be the most resilient we can for our community and we intentionally do so we do not ignore the reality we understand how um, risky this um, period of time is for um, the um, the weakest part of our community the most marginalized uh, and underprivileged groups in our community are now under higher risk um, to lose what they have and um, um, and with this acknowledgement we um, we believe that our role now is to be there for them and keep do what we do um, when their lived experiences are the, will be the least um, shaken and at risk as, as they can be. Um, I will I will maybe say that we also feel that it is our responsibility in the current situation. Um, it's interesting to say this in a wider bridge in, in a wider bridge webinar, but um, since uh, queer people come from all a political stances, we do see ourselves as sort of a bridge at a time when uh, public discourse is becoming very populist and very um, inflammatory to to be uh, a source of, of you know reason, calm, empathy, and understanding in in the Israeli political situation. Thank you. Um, it's you know I'm hearing the words that you're using: stability and safety, and and keeping the community together. And um, you know, for me, I'm remembering times when I went to court and I heard now a member of Knesset. Ben Gvir, um, you know, defending uh, Yishai Slishel. So just starts there. His his um, his career is full full of these um, really uh, homophobic moments, uh, and not only that. And so I wonder how how are you working towards the stability of Mona? Maybe you can um, tell us more about. How how this moment is impacting the most vulnerable communities in Jerusalem in 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 our community, and um, and what are some of the ways that you are creating stability in this moment? So, I will say that, um, like Alon said, we do realize how negatively our community can be impacted by this government. We take it seriously and we are uh, and um, and one of the reasons that we're working towards resilience and stability is that we believe that the um, the harmful impact of this government could last quite a while. Um, and we don't, we're not preparing for a sprint, we are preparing for a marathon. So we do also want to conserve the energy of LGBTQ plus activists uh, that we work with in order to um to create a lot like to, to create a long time, a, a long a, a, a movement against uh, whatever it, it is to come. Um, I will say that in Jerusalem, we always deal with great gaps of privilege and standing within our community. We are a city that has a very large ultra-Orthodox uh, community and a very large Arab-speaking community. Uh, the residents of East Jerusalem are some of the most underprivileged uh, people in, in Israel, but also the LGBTQ plus people within 
that community deal uh, with even more complex layers of oppression within that. Um, and it's always a challenge realizing that even access to activism is in of itself a privilege and that uh, in order to make sure that we advocate for all the different parts of our community in, in an effective and um, manner, we have to build up a point of power throughout the community. And it has been our practice at the JOH for many years now to create spaces in which people with intersecting identities like LGBTQ plus Arab speaking people or LGBTQ plus ultra Orthodox people can come together. And, uh, and we're also working recently with, with the Russian community and the Ethiopian community can come together and understand what their voice of a community is, what their special needs are, what, um, and what they need to um, our community to put forth. So um, as, you know, the, the, the most obvious things is that as uh, LGBTQ plus phobia becomes more and more normalized and people who are very, uh, very much appear LG a queer uh, are exposed to more violence, but also it is more complicated for people who come from very anti-government uh, spaces to reach out for help. On the other hand, this political environment is also a form of PR for our organization because um, religious le leaders and political leaders of very conservative communities uh, speak very openly against the Jerusalem Open House. And we do find more and more people from communities without access for the internet, for, in, uh, for instance, whether it's due to issues of infrastructure or, do, or it's a religious choice, do hear about the Jerusalem Open House and they come to us now. Um, and our hope is that uh, by working with these people coming to us now and uh, helping them build their, um, their you know, political backbone and their ability to say what they need and what they want, and building them up to positions of power within the community, we will be able to strengthen a, our resilience on one, on one hand and also broaden the services that we offer these communities. Thank you. That's beautiful and fascinating. Um, and, and continuing in that, in that um, direction, can you tell us a little bit about what the last few couple of months, few weeks have been like for the Jerusalem Open House? Uh, call, do you have more people showing up, calling hotlines? And um, like you said, there's a moment of PR when Haredi Rabbi mentions the name of the Jerusalem Open House. Um, you, you might get people walking through your doors. And so if you could tell us, you know, a little bit about that. And as you did just start talking about folks in, in East Jerusalem, if there's anything else that we could know um, that's specific to this time, please share. Um, so we, as I said, we do, see a, we, we do see people from conservative communities we haven't been able to reach before reaching out to the Jerusalem Open House. Uh, but in general, we've always had um, people from all across Jerusalem coming to the JOH, and I'm sure you know that as a former employee of the organization. We do put, a, like I said, we do put a great focus on, on making sure that the organization and, our, uh, and the people who are active within it are more and more diverse and bring more and more points of view to the decision-making process. But um, I think the hardest, uh, the hardest part of that is that while we, uh, we, we get um, uh, people calling in or coming or even just, you know, walking into the Jerusalem open house, one of my favorite parts of the, like of my day is the, when someone walks into the Jerusalem open house and is like, hi, I'm gay. And that's it. Like it's both of our problem now. <laughs> like it's your problem too. Um, great, great, yeah, welcome, right. great. Yeah, it's like I used to sit. I used to sit in the office right across from the door. Yeah, and then I have that like, feeling. People come in, they're like, "I'm gay." 
and you're like, okay, let's go from here. What do you want to do with that? Um, so we, 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 people come in with very, very complex uh, situations and some of them are in uh, immediate danger or in very complicated situations. And at the same time, the resources that we have to, to offer people in, in, in the, in these situations are a, either non-existent or in danger of being closed. So that creates a lot of fear. And that's part of the reason that we, again, try to turn to resources from within the community. Um, and it, we see more and more situations of trans people losing their, like losing their home and a, needing to find a new housing situation. Um, I will say that with uh, with very from people who come from very conservative uh, homes, uh, we usually go through a longer process of trying to figure out how they can become financially independent before they come out of the closet. And that's usually less dangerous, but that's a privilege for people who can be straight passing for a while and not everyone can. Yeah. And um, I wonder if you could bring some of the voices of the youngest folks in, um, in the open house. That was also one of my most greatest privileges was seeing kids um kids grow up and become themselves and then become drag kings and drag queens <laughs> um so you know what what can you tell us from the youth program right now how 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 are the young people of the open house and of jerusalem experiencing this this larger movement mm -hmm. so i will say that gen z will probably save us all they are amazing <laughs> Um, they're very aware. I think one of the most exciting things that is happening now with the youth program is that we see more and more parents come in with their kids and wanting to be together with their kids in this process of understanding their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And that's really exciting. And that brings like on a whole, like this whole new field of intervention that we can do together with families that wasn't very accessible before. Um, but we see people coming out of the closet younger and younger. We've actually lowered the, the starting age for our groups this year. And, um, and I think they are very much afraid uh, uh, within, within the, 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 the current political situation. They have a lot of questions about it. A lot of uh, uh, they look for a lot of uh, information, which you know is hard. To, it's 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 just very easy to access information when you grew up in this day and age, but it's very hard to access <laughs> accurate information. So uh, they they do expect us to be uh, honest and and objective with them, but uh, um, they're also. The, they have such a knowledge of themselves and the fact that they grew up in, in a society where LGBTQ plus language was accessible and they could understand themselves from a very young age. Is, um, you can really, really see what a beautiful effect that can have on, on their understanding of themselves. So um, it's, it's very interesting to see how how much they they know that they deserve the respect of other people and they know that they deserve basic human rights and you know they know it to their core which i think for very long um people from the lgbtq plus community had to come into that realization once they became activists a lot of us still out here working on that realization <laughs> i think so yeah so they're like i deserve respect i just i'm like yes <laughs> I, I've been preached of onto by like 12 year old baby gays. And I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's good to know. They're going to need all that confidence and all that strength. 
Um, mm. That's really beautiful. So we're going to change. I want to change the, the uh, conversation a little bit to focus on something that I know that's on a lot of our minds um, at a wider bridge. Uh, we want to talk about the upcoming Pride March in Jerusalem, um, or as I like to call it, my family reunion. Because I just love this, I just love this march. Don't tell anyone, but I've never been to the Tel Aviv Pride March. Um, and Jerusalem was my home, and and I went for over ten years um, while I was living in Israel every year, in and out, seeing um, seeing how the community grows and how the community changes, and and what an honor to be there, whether marching with my own child or marching with a walkie-talkie and in touch with police. It's been um, always for me just a highlight. So um, what can you tell us about the upcoming Pride? How is it gonna be impacted by these protests and the interactions with the police, which have always been, always over the long period of time have been uh, contentious and not, not simple. So what's the plan? Yeah, so the march is going to take place on June 1st. Um, it's Thursday. Um, afternoon and we expect a big audience this year probably bigger than the last couple of years and probably we we hope um the biggest march ever in jerusalem um yeah like the political situation even before the judiciary um thing now yeah a, Right before the government was born, um, we heard uh, now Minister uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir saying he would seek to ban Jerusalem Pride March, right? And um, and we we do believe that Ben-Gvir and his colleagues and friends will do the best they can um, to to cancel in which you know, whatever ways we can imagine to cancel the Jerusalem march. And it's not an easy um, thing to do considering the fact that the Jerusalem march is a demonstration um, as opposed to the Tel Aviv Pride Parade, um, which is a cultural event and is organized and funded by the Tel Aviv municipality. The Jerusalem March for Pride and Tolerance is, um, is a demonstration. We go to the police um, to make sure they um, protect us. And we go to the municipality of Jerusalem to make sure they allow us um, to use the public gardens we use at Ghana Pamon and Ghana Smoot in Jerusalem. Um, yeah, so, so let's put it this way. If you hear like around May, like in, in the couple of weeks before June 1st, that there's again this conversation about um, banning on, or, or, or canceling the Jerusalem, March, the Jerusalem Pride, um, you will know for sure that there is a big problem. Like if, if, a, if the right to demonstrate and to protest is in danger, then the Israeli democracy is really in a bad place, right? But putting that aside, um, we do expect Big audience, we do expect a wider bridge uh, mission to join us, which is really exciting. And I know you still, uh, your mission is still open for registration. So I really encourage those folks who are considering this to join the mission. Um, and we hope other communities um, will be inspired by the wider bridge. A ambition a, and support of us in this sense. We do expect also um, bigger national and international um, attention this year, even more than usual. And you all know how um, the Jerusalem March is um, attracting 
attention every year. Um, so this year it's gonna be bigger, and we do we do expect new challenges in in terms of the new government and and what they can do. Um, we, to be honest, we don't really, like, we're not afraid. I mean, we know that the Jerusalem march will march in whatever cir circumstances will be. Um, and we, we do strategize on how to deal with these uh, challenges that we expect to happen. Um, and we we will be so happy and so glad to know more and more folks from the US from a wider bridge will join us. Yeah, well, you did a part of our you did a part of our job for us, which is to uh, say that we're going to be joining you um, with a mission, a wider bridge mission um, for Pride in Jerusalem. And we uh, we shared the link to last year's live stream video, and we will be live streaming again as well, um, which is very exciting. And when I did you want to add something? I saw I saw a spark in your eyes that you maybe wanted to add something. I always have a spark in my eyes. When there I'm we go. Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a, a very big this year. And, do you uh, imagine that the relationship with the police, the, this question can be for either, either of you, but do you imagine that the relationship with the police is shifting or re remaining as tense as ever or changing? Well, we, we are working very closely with the police to make sure that uh, the march is safe. Um, it's always a challenge working within an organization which is very uh, conservative and militant and the, just what the police is. But uh, but we've, I think after what happened with the Shira Banki in 2015, I think the Israeli police understood like understood its responsibility to the safety of the people participating in the Jerusalem Pride and Tolerance March. And um, and I, I, I do trust our partners within the police that they will do the best of their professional ability to make sure that pride is safe. Uh, whether they will be nice about it, I don't know, but, uh, but they will be there and they will be professional. Mm -hmm. And during the last couple of years, um, we've had significant successes in terms of, um, of communicating with the Jerusalem police in advance and joining their um, internal trainings for the commanders. Um, oh, that's great. And yeah, yeah. And and uh, we will we are lucky to have Emunah leading these uh, workshops. Um, and you can only imagine um, the the effect that uh, the effect that these um, meetings have on the on the police uh, on the police officers before the march. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so uh, before we open to questions from the audience, we. Should we hope to get to in a few minutes. So please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A section and either they'll be answered or we'll bring them up. Um, and welcome, Ethan. Um, Shalom, Ethan. Um, Ethan is joining us a little bit late, but we're very happy to, to have him and bring him in in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, Alon, what can we tell to our audience today and to anybody who's going to watch this recording afterwards, because we're going to try and promote this recording and, and get, get your voices out to as many people as want to hear them. So what can people do to help right now, to help you, to help the Jerusalem Open House, to help the queer community in Jerusalem? Thank you for asking that. Um, so first, joining us um, on June 1st in Jerusalem, if you are able to do that and visit, uh, and visit Israel this summer and attend the Jerusalem March, it will be the best 
thing for 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 our local community and for the partnership. Um, you are always welcome to visit the GOH and bring your friends, communities, congregations. Um, we love hosting and we love meeting new audiences um, and answering tough questions. And, <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't uh, visit Jerusalem this summer, you can definitely support us online. Um, increasing LGBTQ plus visibility um, online is is so meaningful. Um, it helps us um, get new people uh, be interested in what we do and be interested in the issue of LGBTQ plus lives in Israel in general and in Jerusalem specifically. And um, it it is very very meaningful um, and uh, um, um, you are more than welcome to reach out to us and contact us and uh, and share with us any idea you have. I mean, it will be just great um, to have new ideas if you think of something we haven't thought of yet. We love to hear. Well, I did hear about a particularly charming uh, campaign that you have going on. If you want to tell us about your your very charming and poignant campaign, the Avima was fun. Yeah, I'll I'll actually let Emuna introduce the initiative, and it's her idea, and she led this amazing thing. So go on, Emuna. So I will say that another way you can support us is by donating to the Avi Ma'oz Fund for LGBTQ plus visibility in Jerusalem, which we opened in the name of MK Avi Ma'oz from the infamous Noam party uh, when he was negotiating his place in the current coalition. Um, he uh, declared that one of his a, one of his goals is canceling a Jerusalem Pride. Um, and it was very important for us to send the message to our, a, to our community that the existence of the Jerusalem Pride and of course the existence of LGBTQ plus people in Jerusalem isn't dependent on uh, you know, the wishes and hopes of a political party. Or, a, or any political persona whatsoever. And um, since everyone was very busy with talking about his approach to pride, we decided to um, allow him to have some kind of positive impact on, a, on a everyday life in Jerusalem. And we dedicated a special fund in his name. Um, we wrote him a letter of thank you for his participation in raising awareness to LGBTQ plus issues and LGBTQ plus organizations. Um, and anyone who's interested in taking a part of turn, in turning this, uh, this man's very vocal and blunt LGBTQ plus phobia and turning it around and helping us use it to advance uh, the visibility of our community and the services that we can offer our community. I know that Yael just posted a link. You're more than welcome to donate. We will send him a thank you note in your name. We'll still do that. Um, and you are more than welcome to join us in turning this around as best as possible. And I will say that it was a blast working on this campaign and we all had a very, it was like a breath of fresh air to be able to laugh about this. And it's also something that I wanna invite all of you to do. It was our choice not to participate in his political spin and his, you know, his PR campaign, but turn it into our, our own. And, um, and it's something that we invite you all to do. Just take a breath and make sure that our participation in the current political discourse is responsible and is um, and is forwarding 
what our community needs and not sending us backwards. I love that. I love that. That's uh, I'm very I'm very motivated to get some thank you <laughs> letters um, written out. And it's very uniquely Jerusalem and Israeli, but it's very uniquely Jerusalem to find something so funny about something <laughs> that is so so hard. And really, and and you know, and in my experience, we always have um, in different organizations also in Jerusalem. I always found that, um, but this is good. I like. I like the positive spin. I'm here for it. Um, it's, also, it's also like it, it was his political spin to attack pride while he was trying to get gain control over what Jewish education is in the Israeli Jewish right. education system. And that it was very clearly a rouge in order to, you know, distract people from what he was really doing. And it was also very important for us to send the message that no matter how much government funding he gets, he is not, he doesn't get to be in charge of what being Jewish means, and he doesn't get to be in charge of the Jewish identity. And any uh, any note that we send him will have Talmudic phrases in it. And uh, <laughs> you are more than welcome to be a part of this campaign. <laughs> Wonderful. So hopefully we're sharing that link in the, um in the chat here. Um, we, I wanna open up, I got some, in my direct messages, I got some of the Q and A's. Cindy, wanna bring Cindy back? Yes, yes. So um, we've got a couple questions that were asked during this very, very interesting conversation. And before I go to the questions, I wanna thank all of the, the panelists for, for sharing, um, sharing what they have shared. So, Here's uh, one of the questions. The Speaker of the Knesset, the third most important position in Israel, is openly gay. Does that give you confidence that Israel will continue to support gay rights? What do you think, uh, Alon? And anybody want to take that? I don't think we should be confident that okay. anyone will continue to support human rights. Human rights is something that you should always be actively, uh, if, you know, trying to advocate for and trying to 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 base. But um, it 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 is very. We were very. Uh, we at the open house congratulated M.K. Amir Ochana when he got this position. Um, but considering who else is in this coalition and considering a, a how a outspoken this coalition is against LGBTQ plus rights, I don't think we can be confident because one member of it, I mean, uh, we, we, we try not to, we try not to be confident, too confident ever, and certainly not in this situation. So we are monitoring it. <laughs> okay, well, the next question. And again, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. What are the best strategies to use when US LGBT organizations voice suspicion of Israel generally, and thus are reluctant to come to the support of LGBT communities in Israel? What do you say to those who accuse Israel of pinkwashing in view of the latest events? Alon, you want to start on that one? Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Um... <laughs> There's a lot of folks here in the United States who, um, as a matter of fact, working for Jewish Community Services, we have heard of folks who, um, who don't support Israel and they call it pinkwashing and they think that anything that Israel does in support of the LGBT community is just to, you know, cover up all of the other bad things that are happening in Israel. Um, any thoughts on that? Because there's a lot of that in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> you wanna you want to take this one? Okay. I think he's sliding it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say that anything 
uh, that Israel does to support uh, the LGBTQ plus community is due to the very hard work of LGBTQ plus activists in Israel. It is never easily won. But more than that, I think that people who raise suspicions of pinkwashing are pointing to the very real issue that, as we know, human rights are human rights are human rights. And if you advance the human rights of one uh, marginalized group while uh, neglecting to, to take responsibility for the human rights of another marginalized group, then, um, then, then the sustainability of human rights is, is they're not, they're not, it's not as strong. And, um, and I, and I do think that pinkwashing is a real issue that should be considered. But one thing that I do wish to note is that a very important voice is missing from this conversation. And that is the voice of LGBTQ plus Arab speaking people from the Israeli area. And that is due to the fact that they are dealing with such complicated oppressions against them and their ability to speak up as LGBTQ plus people from within this conflict is basically inexistent. And I think that any, um, any like people, I think that trying to, there, there is, I always try to look at this issue from two perspectives. There is the perspective, which is what values we hold and what, uh, and what our ideology is, which is very important to be outspoken about. But there is also the issue of practicality and people who live within this situation. And the minute our values become more important than people, we have a problem. Within this conflict, there are people, LGBTQ plus people, who are dealing with serious issues and, um, and, want, and, and, and the fact that the advancement of queer rights in Israel involves some pinkwashing is a very complicated fact of life at the moment. It is something that should be taken seriously, but it can prevent us from wanting to support the advancement, the advancement of human rights in Israel. It's like counteractive. Um, and I think that, that when someone raises this issue of pinkwashing, what I want to do is I want to sit with it. I want to sit with it and say it is a very complicated and serious issue. It is something that should be considered. It's not something that's going to be solved tomorrow or in a second or, or like in two weeks or next year. But it is something that right. can't prevent us from progressing right now. We have to progress while we're having this conversation. Right, right. Okay, that takes us into our next question. Uh, the existing democracy protests have been reluctant to enable the voices of support for Palestinian rights. Do you see this as being allowed or even encouraged in the Jerusalem Pride March? So the Jerusalem Pride March is a demonstration. It is, of course, an open demonstration, and, and we are happy with all the voices that are brought to, to the protest. And it definitely includes um, anti-occupation um, messages, and it includes a large spectrum of, uh, of views we don't monitor and we don't control the messages that are brought up in the pride march we believe the more diversity is uh, the bigger it is um it's like it is more authentic and and basically brings to life the messages and the values that our community has uh, so any other thoughts short on that? Short answer is yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, 
Um, in my experience, one of the most uh, one of the most beautiful things at the pray, at the Pride March in Jerusalem is the diversity, and I I am very impacted. And, and one of the things that I'm taking away from this conversation is definitely what Emuna was also just saying, um, and and I remember this very much. But that there is such an added oppression on Palestinian folk in this situation that. Um, that to take for granted that they could that that anyone who wants to can march without uh, a sense of danger when you're talking about someone who's Palestinian lives in East Jerusalem, um, you know that's that's very significant, and I I appreciate that that point a lot. Yeah. Um, what efforts have been made to form alliances against the threats from the extreme conservative religious government with the, with the Israeli secular community, women's groups, reform, and conservative Jews, etc.? cetera? Um, well, we work with many, many partners all the time. Uh, we, we just finished uh, creating our 2022 yearly report and I made a list of all the organizations I've worked with in 2022, and there are over 200 of them. Um, so uh, I, I don't think, I think it's a relation, these relationships are relationships that we've been holding uh, over time. The Jerusalem Open House always stood for values such as equality, feminism, you know, gender freedom, sexual freedom, that is our DNA. Um, and we are working with the civil or like with civil organizations in this climate as well. Um, I think one of the things that is very complex for us at the moment is the fact that we serve many, many people who um, and we want to include and welcome into our community many, many people who don't necessarily hold these values as well. For instance, LGBTQ plus people who come from ultra Orthodox communities don't necessarily identify with gender freedom or sexual freedom. And it is our challenge to accept them and welcome them as well. But we've always worked with partners from women's organizations and all, all of the above. Excellent. Alan, anything to add to that? No? Okay. Um, we hear a lot about the possibility of a new inifada, which I had to look up, so I'll define it for folks who might not know what it means, a uh, Palestinian uprising against the Israeli occupation. Um, so we hear a lot about the possibility of that. How are Jerusalem open house, Arab Israelis, and Palestinians talking about this one? Are they talking? about this one uh. um, i am not privy to their conversations right okay what they do share with us is that they are very afraid um mm -hmm. last may we had we had to suspend some of our arab speaking services because um those are our you know our community members from east jerusalem couldn't not last may the may before that may 2021 Mm -hmm. um, couldn't safely come to the Jerusalem open house. And, um, and I think, like I said, what we're trying to do is make sure that our connection with those community members stays strong and continuous throughout any challenges that may come. Um, they are very afraid. I think for many people, the challenge with coming from a very homophobic and transphobic background Mm -hmm. is in moments like this, being proud of the community they grew up in, the culture that brought them up. And we try the best we can to give them space to reconnect, not only with their LGBTQ plus identity, but with their Arab identity as well, which can be very complicated in this city, in this setting. Yeah. Alan, anything to add? No? I have the best partner here ever. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's always good to have a great partner. Um, Alan, you addressed this a little bit, and this will be the last question. Uh, but with the question, maybe you have a little bit more um, thoughts. We hear mixed opinions from Israelis about the proper role of US Jews. That what is happening there is not our business, and that what's happening there is, is 
of concern to all Jews everywhere. What's your perspective on this? And how can U.S. Jews best support you? Like you address this a little bit, but in terms of the over overall question. Yeah, I would like to quote uh, one of my favorite singers, Sting. He has this line uh, where he said, I don't subscribe to this point of view, right? So I don't, don't subscribe to this. Uh, a, a, the sentiment that we've heard from Minister Amichai Chikli saying to the US, mind your own business. Um, I strongly oppose this. I think um, the bridge we work on and we believe in, and this is why we partner with a wider bridge and with many partners around the US and the world, um, the bridge between um, us in Israel and, and and Jewish folks and communities around the world is so important and vital for our future. Um, I believe the reason um, don't think this way say it out loud is because they are, they're afraid. They're afraid of the pressure and the power that um, you, U.S. jury has, and thanks God, thank God that you have this power and influence, um, and the partnership we have um, is such an important one. Um, and I strongly encourage all of you: please mind our business. We need you. We need your. We need your support. We need your perspective. We need to be in dialogue. We can't um, let them separate us. Right. Well, we're we're here for you. <laughs> so, um, so we want to close it up now. And with that, I will turn it back to Shira, who will introduce our lovely executive Thank director, so who much. can make some closing comments. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Cindy. And, and I, I just want to add to Alon's words that um, Anat Hoffman, who's one of the very great heroes of uh, Jerusalem fight for equality and pluralism, has always said that Israel is too important to leave up to Israelis. And I am an Israeli married to an Israeli. I, 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 I take that, I take that uh, with, with a big hug and a kiss and say that it's up to all of us together. Um, to be doing this work. So uh, thank you both. And I am going to welcome Ethan for some final thoughts and notes. Thank you, Shira. And thank you, Cindy, uh, for leading this conversation. And Alon and Emuna, thank you very much for your wisdom and your kind of calm reflection during a, a time that is anything but uh, calm. You really help us to, to navigate a very complex situation. Uh, and we're so grateful for everything that you do and our partnership with you. Um, I wanna just say to everybody who's been on this important uh, webinar, uh, thank you for being with us and stay connected look for more information about programs like this that are educational communications that we're gonna send out, keeping people uh, uh, informed. Uh, if you have an interest out there in joining a wider bridge on one of our missions, please let us uh, know. I wanna flag for people that we're gonna be doing a very interesting program in a couple of weeks on a book by Corrine Blackmer, Queering Anti-Zionism. So keep an eye out for that. And the most important thing I wanna say is uh, there is an urgency to this moment for all of us in the Wider Bridge family uh, to do more. And I, I wanna focus attention particularly uh, on our impact grants program. We gave $180,000 uh, 
last year and impact grants to 20 different organizations. Please understand out there that these organizations have dramatically increased needs. Public expressions of homophobia have increased. Calls to hotlines are through the roof. Groups like Jerusalem Open House and the other LGBTQ organizations are organizing people for protests. They need more resources um, for lobbying because funding that they thought was secure may not be secure. And so keep posted. We're going to make an announcement about our impact grants program and the fact that we need to do more. And please be in touch with us if you are listening to this program and you have the capacity to help Israeli LGBTQ. The moment is now, the needs are now. We need to reframe our understanding of the Israeli LGBTQ community as having a particular vulnerability in this moment and time. And we can and should continue to celebrate all of the accomplishments, but we have a responsibility to be there to ensure that they can continue to do what they need to do to protect the most vulnerable in the LGBTQ community. So again, thank you to our panelists and to all of you who are with us today. Stay tuned. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Happy Purim. <laughs> thank you. Happy, Happy Purim. Yeah.